Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello and welcome to Science Faction, episode 53, Science Faction Iodine. Oh, hey, that's one that we know. Yeah. We should have this episode added to Assault, just to help Americans. <laughs> that's right. That is the 53rd element. I am your host, Robert Timothy, part-time comedian, full-time archaeologist, and with me is our full-time real scientist, Jackie, our biomedical research scientist. How are you doing, Jackie? I'm good, except I, I'm a little nervous. Why are you? I, I purposely haven't been checking my email, because I'm kind of afraid what happened to Allison Rosen might happen to Oh, me. because uh, <laughs> on, on the Adam Carolla show... <laughs> He unceremoniously email fired his like, fem- right like a day after Christmas. His female co-host. She was um, late to the best of episode. Well, it might have been his baby. Who knows? Well, there is no need to worry, Jackie, because the only person who's getting one of those emails is our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, you're so replaceable. How are you doing today? <laughs> Doing great. Was there a reason I saw Alison Rosen leaving just as I walked? Yeah, in? She's, <laughs> listen, she's expressed an interest. Two women on a podcast? Is this madness? <laughs> Don Draper would shoot himself if he found out that his kids would be doing this or grandkids. <laughs> the so will other people in the madhouse's parking lot. Yeah. When we've doubled the amount of car accidents that occur. <laughs> uh, we're not technically at Madhouse today. We had a scheduling conflict, but if you would like to check out Madhouse, you should check out Damien when he goes into round two of San Diego's Ooh, Funniest Person, which is up. coming up sometime soon right you know it hasn't even been scheduled but i like that we're building this up it's yeah. like how yeah. uh, independence day was the first movie to be uh, mm-hmm. advertised a year in advance i want my victory to be the first victory advertised about a year in advance all right this is more of a geely <laughs> but uh we will be back Ooh. at the madhouse next week this is our first real show of the year guys i'm pretty psyched yeah this is gonna be a fun one i like to review some of the science stuff we missed in the last half of the year that mm-hmm. was going on also uh like to make sure to share with you guys that we don't always celebrate new year's eve a lot of times we celebrate the perihelium right yeah. which, which is when the earth is closest to the sun it was uh january 4th which is when i sent that email to damien so oh hey yeah <laughs> Well, I guess I shouldn't feel too bad about not making my resolutions this year right out, like the day after. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right, see, I didn't fail on the first. I failed yeah. on the fifth. It wasn't yeah. completely different. So you had like three days of total bliss. Exactly. Well, it was actually the fourth, but that those kind of number differences <laughs> is why we let you go. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science article. All right, guys, a couple of interesting articles that I found. Number one, the blowhole of youth. You've been to that gay bar? I love yeah. it. It's the best. <laughs> yeah, I heard they got busted by the cops a couple times for stash. <laughs> they do have, they're the only ones carting people, and if you're over 40, you're not allowed yeah, in. Yeah, that's the mm, way it works. Gross. In fact, the longest lived mammal on Earth is the bowhead whale, which lives to be over 200 years old. Wow. And some interesting things, if you were to think about it from our perspective, Jackie, we all know that, that cancer is essentially inevitable. The longer you live... Only you, you and I do. Yes. Damien cannot get that through his head. I, listen, it's embarrassing. Listen, I, listen, I cancer is the secret This is you. one of the reasons we're getting rid of him. Okay. Okay. Sooner I die, the sooner I get to go to heaven and live forever. Okay, <laughs> just, just do me a favor. Go home. Check your spam. Cancer is essentially, for us, a statistical inevitability. The longer you live, the chances just go up and up till it hits 100%. You will get a cancer someplace, uh, likely multiple places if you live long enough. That's just the way it works. It's how it's a problem with how our cells divide and, and things like that. What's really interesting is you would think this animal, who lives to be 200 years old, would almost certainly get cancer. Plus, it's got literally a thousand times more cells than yeah. we do. It should have a thousand <laughs> times more likelihood of getting cancer just when it's our age. Yeah. Is it because their cells just aren't so divided? They have a great unifier I, uniting them, <laughs> and so no cancer. Like Hitler. What, do you, Listen, do you, you know what? <laughs> we can sit here and, you know, armchair quarterback world leaders, you know, 60 years. <laughs> let's, just, let's just say that the cells are more like Che Guevara. Okay. You know, that'll work just fine. Why not? That explains my sh- your shirt much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whale. <laughs> With a hat. With a hat. <laughs> So uh, the fact that they're a thousand times larger than us and they live more than twice as long means they should have a lot more cancers, but they don't. And so it's really confusing and also kind of, hey, maybe we could figure something out with this. So a team of researchers recently did a genetic test using a female bowhead whale and a bunch of different whales and other mammals from humans all the way down to rodents to see... the orgy of science. Yeah. And let me tell you, those are intimate extraction sections. Yeah. Blowhole alone. (laughs) Sorry. This is a lab coats optional zone. <laughs> you know about those? 
And they compared the genetics of these animals, and they found that changes in bowhead genes that are related to cell division, DNA repair, cancer, and aging seem to help increase their longevity and cancer resistance. And normally whales already have a lower metabolic rate than other animals because they're larger animals. Mm-hmm. It's a way they deal with being so big and not using up energy when they yeah. when they don't need to. When you said that larger animal quote, did you just say, fuck our whale listeners? Like, I don't care That's if they're right. offended. I'm going to say just horrible offensive shit to our, that demographic. Listen, as far as our whale listeners go, they're very scientifically educated whales. <laughs> and yeah. they understand they are larger creatures than others. They're not going to take offense to that. They're applauding me right now through whale song. <laughs> You know, as a scientist, I thought you might learn a little thing or two about the ineffectiveness of fat shaming. (laughs) (laughs) Little little tidbit about metabolism in animals. Surface Mm -hmm. area to volume ratio will always dictate that the larger the animal, the slower the metabolism. So that's why a mouse has very fast metabolism, whereas a whale, very, very slow. I think you're forgetting about slowpoke Rodriguez. That's an old cartoon. You know what? Nobody under 20 will ever understand that Okay, there's always an exception to the rule. Slowpoke Rodriguez noted. So whale cells have a much lower metabolic rate like we talked about. But the team also found alterations in bowhead whales in one specific gene involved in thermoregulation called UCP1, which I still think is part of that childhood ICP UCP joke. (laughs) (laughs) Since Sonic the Hedgehog was the name of a gene, it's just been game on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That may be related to these metabolic differences. So the next plan is the team is going to breed mice that can then express the bowhead genes to determine if the mice with those genes then also live longer. If so, we might be doing it with people. They either need to find a really well-hung mouse or a really tight whale. Getting those bowhead genes into a mouse work. I don't. Now listen, I thought you were right at first. Like I thought the exact same thing. Uh, and then I saw the pictures and it turns out average size with both. Wait, go figure. Yeah. Oh, have sex with more whales. All right, guys, a couple questions. Number one, would you give your kids bowhead whale genes in order to guarantee them a long life if the caveat was that they were only capable of eating plankton? <laughs> like, so much plankton. Like, your house would reek of plankton. Yes, it would reek of plankton for 200 motherfucking years while that kid enjoyed yeah, the good why life. Why would you want your kid... Why would you want a kid? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Jackie, assuming another person fell out of you uh-huh. and you cared okay. about this other person for whatever reason, don't okay. ask me. It's the same thing that makes you all weird when you're in a period. The, you cared for this kid it's now. Nice. <laughs> it's real nice. You cared. I'm weird all the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Assuming mm-hmm. that goes on and you want the best for them, would you then give your kids the gene to live that long? But the downside is the plankton. I got to be honest. The way politics are happening and global warming and everything, I don't know that I want them to live that long. I think I think the solid 70 years is probably going to be enough. I think it's the a way, huge Paul, You don't want them to live to see the second black president? Is that what yeah. you're – is that what you're like, – because that no, sounds No, I'm talking racist. more about the whole Republican Congress v. the president going on yeah. okay. inevitably. Let me, let me secede at some point. Let me do yeah. this and let me see if this changes your mind. Okay. If you think about it, you'd still retire, right? They'd still get a pension or they'd still get whatever, and it'll take a while for the government to to catch up and to Mm -hmm. change that age. So if your kid's in that sweet spot, they retire normally at 65 or whatever. They still live to be 210. It's the equivalent of one of us now retiring at like 30 and then just living the rest of their life partying. Your investments are maturing. Yeah. You're just getting richer and richer off the sweat of other people. It's fantastic. You mentioned getting off. Can we go back to that? Yeah. <laughs> so, before I answer this question, is this extra life? Are we just stretching out his life so 100 is the new 50? Yes. Or are we just hacking these years onto the end? No. In which case, you know, like you're 65 <laughs> yeah. at 65, but you're forced to live to 200. Yeah. One, 100 isn't the new 50. 100 is the new like 44 or 40. What, what's the average? It's less than 40, right? It's because yeah. you'd be 80. So for dudes it would be like 39 100 would be the new 39 and you would have been retired for 40 fucking years waiting to go for the rest of your life oh well then absolutely and and unlike her she says like that's so yeah over the lifetime that's so much plankton unless they are the size of a whale i don't i think it would probably just be an average no but it's proportionate to their body size it's a huge amount sure but like we don't eat pounds of food now oh, like of, of one type of food like okay I agree. let's assume you're gonna feed this kid 
daily. Yeah, you're going to get a deal from some manufacturer, and you're just going to be shipping in big. It's probably going to be cheaper than getting them the regular food anyway. Wait, wait, wait. does he have? Now, baleen? Do they have baleen? Yeah, some... like when he smiles in pictures, is that weird baleen? Yeah. No, he gross. just he just eats it normally. It's the only way he can get nutrition. I, this is a simple <laughs> idea. I don't know why you guys are making this weird. I am all about this, and yes, absolutely, because I unlike her, where she said, yeah, you know, it would be a lot of plankton compared to how much plankton a mouse would eat, but not as much. But you know, what would be shitty how us we would suffer because yeah. we don't have this gene. Yeah. Unless gene therapy can add it later, is that they're going to be like imagine reaching into a bunch of jelly beans and like just oh that's cherry and then or strawberry and then oh my god that's the plankton one. It is it is people <laughs> like you and I who would suffer. But the thing is they wouldn't want a plankton jelly bean in there because they can't eat the other jelly beans. They can only eat plankton, and so they would have all no, their plankton no stuff separate. Think about this kid's life. Like, l- let's say that we could do this for our kids, but others yeah. couldn't, right? Because we're white and privileged. Okay. So let's say they're on a field trip and they have to whip out plankton in front of all the other kids. I mean, that's embarrassing. Think of how this kid. Also, if- they're a baby while the other kids are 10. That's also <laughs> weird. <laughs> that's Jack in reverse. And. That Benjamin guy, Button in reverse. <laughs> not even. Wait, no, not even really at all. <laughs> this goes both ways. What if your son gets or daughter gets life in jail? Okay, that's a good point. Oh, you yeah, want to avoid that. Sword. You want to avoid that as much that's as possible. That's a really good possibility for Damien's kid too. Yeah. Okay. So not for your kids, actually. Maybe not a not a good plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, my son. If as soon as he got caught, he would no longer be my son. <laughs> Question number two, since slow metabolism is associated with long life, are people exercising themselves to an early grave? Jackie, when we speed up our metabolism, are we speeding our aging process? Um, I mean, I guess by that logic we are. But I think we've established that there is a sweet spot of exercise mm-hmm. to keep uh, the metabolism in check. But uh, I, 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 don't, I understand I don't know this. But we're... So if you had somebody who maybe did a healthy amount of exercise but constituted making their metabolism go pretty strong yeah. and did a lot of cardio and stuff like that, uh, still within what we would consider the healthy range, are they cycling their cells so much and causing, one, more opportunities for cancer because there's going to be more cell division and more everything like that, but number two, also more chances of a problem, like aging. Being, are they essentially okay, aging that earlier? Right, because metabolism itself isn't necessarily just cell replication. That's just what's going on in your cells. Sure. So um, I don't know that that would really make you live longer. We there, do, there's something to be said for a slow metabolism. But we do know that there are certain metabolic changes that are associated with old age diseases that happen when there's problems with metabolism yeah, later in life. You seen slow metabolism – earlier in life also contributes to the acquisition of the diseases uh, you know interesting so i i don't think so okay Damien, I'm gonna, what do you think i'm gonna still go on that theory <laughs> damon do you think people are exercising themselves to an early grave i think absolutely we've touched on this before but more importantly and this is what your article is not covering is the social death that occurs from people who exercise too much be it mm. crossfit marathoning nobody yeah. wants to hang out with those people yeah and so who cares if they die? Like, we don't track that. Science... I think those are the people that are attracted to that as opposed to that making them that way. I'm getting you a CrossFit man. Correlation. See how long it takes for you to... <laughs> Not causation. Well, let's see. Question number three. If we do incorporate whale DNA into our genome, drastically lengthening our lifespans, the overpopulation problem will become epidemic as no one dies off to make room for the next generation. Soon chaos would erupt, and a Mad Max-style world would emerge as everyone tries to kill as many other people as possible to make room for themselves and their descendants. What will your survival strategy be in this world, and what role will you play? The role I play will be father. And I've already been planning for this. Wait, so you're just going to start having a bunch of kids? Yeah. You're acting as if I have the been planning thing? for Come this on. for the last 10 years. My, I only hit on women six foot four and above on dating profiles. <laughs> I have a ton of huge kids coming out there, and that is my <laughs> army. They are going to protect me. Now, but you don't have any contact with these kids. How will you amass this army yeah. once this apocalypse has happened? He's like Vince Vaughn in Delivery Man. Yeah. Where he'll just Here. find them all one day. A much day. darker <laughs> version of it where he's trying to form an evil army of the night. I'd put up like a bat signal, but it'd really just be like a signal of a broken condom, like cast out of the sky, <laughs> and they'd all... Damien, a lot of your kids seem to be black. All right, Jackie... <laughs> What about you? (laughs) Well, speaking of black, I have to assume that because of my singing voice and my incredibly toned legs, I would be Tina Turner. Wait. And that you'd force Down syndrome people to fight for you? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) How dare you question my methods? We'll see you there, gorilla people of Damien. (laughs) Good answers on both accounts. (laughs) Okay, I've never seen Mad Max, but I know Tina Turner was in one of them. (laughs) Well, that was a perfect reference for you. Yeah. 
You have no idea what I was talking about when I said sick I down syndrome people. No idea. Oh wow. <laughs> you're a mo- you're the type of monster who would send a giant muscular down syndrome person to come kill me. Let's start insulting Jackie fair. by preparing her to characters in movies she's never seen, but that sound complimentary. Like, oh, you remind me of Charlize Theron in Monster. Oh. I have seen that one, so fuck oh. you. <laughs> you remind me of Oscar no, Schindler's I boss in <laughs> Schindler's List. <laughs> seen that one too you're uh, like everybody uh, uh, but precious in the movie precious <laughs> <laughs> thank you i have been trimming down <laughs> you're like the female mountain woman from the hills have eyes <laughs> now you're just saying you like you have to make them complimentary guys <laughs> i said <be> female <laughs> <laughs> hey i like what you're wearing today you look like that pretty little girl from the exorcist you're really sweet. You remind me of the social worker from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. Okay, on to article number two, the selfish ribosome. Very interesting concept. It gets a bit complicated, but I think I can walk everybody through it really simply enough. I'll let you explain this. Yeah, mm. you. Why don't you take a seat down, Damien? <laughs> right. I will try and explain this as best I can with some help uh, from Jackie. Start off with the idea of a selfish gene. This is a concept. Let me stop you there, Bobby. It's Jin. This is going to be a long time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this was an idea that came out before Richard Dawkins, but he popularized it in a book by that title, The Selfish Gene. And it was the idea that we think of animals as the things that evolution is acting on. You know, they're, the animal is out in the wild doing this thing. And that is what's driving evolution. That's what evolution is acting on. And the idea of the selfish gene is it's actually, in fact, the genes themselves. Those are the things that are, A, selecting for the proteins that then code to make the things happen in nature. But also, those are the things that are essentially driving evolution that are behind it. Those are the benefactors of it because those genes get to carry on most times long after they're turned off. Over 90% of our DNA doesn't code for anything. It's junk DNA. Those DNA strands have gotten replicated and replicated over and over and over again because they were part of that genetic code. So the idea is that it is a genetic basis for natural selection or Mm -hmm. for evolution as opposed to an actual phenotypical one. So that's the idea of the selfish gene. And what they came out with very recently is a really, really interesting idea. I'm going to have to bounce some of this off Jackie as we talk about it because it's uh, – You can bounce it off me or Richard Dawkins if you prefer. Oh, I forgot that Richard Dawkins <laughs> – Yeah, we talked I to Richard Dawkins. I've been sharing a seat with Dawkins this whole time. I can leave the room and Dawkins can take over. Occasionally prefer. comes I'm in. sure Dawkins wants to share your seat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, first off, uh, he's a very attractive man and, <laughs> and I do not like the way you continually tear him down. Um, while I do feel that Alison Rosen would be a far superior co-host to him <sighs> – you know what, Dawkins? Uh, we were on the fence before, but you made the case. <laughs> Damien, you're out. <laughs> Rosen, you're back in. All right, fa- all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to be following your dog in the corner if you need me. Okay, fine. You have to go fondle the canine. <laughs> so what this new idea comes and says is maybe it's actually not the selfish gene. It's not the DNA itself that is self-perpetuating, that is driving this evolution. In fact, if you think of what a strand of DNA wants to do, it just wants to curl up into a ball naturally. It doesn't stay straight like a string yeah. of yarn. Think of it, you it's know... It's like that, the hedgehog. It prefers to curl up into a ball. Yes, yes that, it, it is similar to a hedgehog. <laughs> yes. It's, so that's, sonic it's or otherwise. the yeah. same. So it likes to like kind of wind itself up. And in order to be copied, it actually has to be pulled, kind of straightened out, and cut open, and, and replicated. And so it's actually a process that doesn't necessarily benefit the DNA in terms of what the DNA is trying to do, which is just sit there and form a shape mm-hmm. based on its protein structure. But what it does benefit is this thing called the ribosome, which is in the cells of all living things. A ribosome is basically what takes that genetic information from the DNA and turns it into proteins, which actually do things. Proteins are what do everything in your body. So, thank, thanks, Richard. <laughs> Well, I'm just here to make sure that you're... Yeah, I'm annoyed. Up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good Are job, you? Richard. <laughs> so this ribosome, the way it does it is, it's actually this thing called RNA, which we've talked about before, which is kind of similar to DNA, mm-hmm. but is made up of these structural ribosome RNAs, which mm-hmm. is a type of RNA that we don't think codes for anything, and that's covered in proteins. And then what it uses is two other kinds of RNA, mRNA, which goes and reads the DNA and Mm -hmm. essentially creates a copy of it. It stands for message RNA. Right. And then tRNA, which then takes that and then kind of arranges the amino acids Mm -hmm. into proteins on the surface of the ribosome. Is that pretty much correct? Yeah, that's transfer RNA. Right. So those are the three kinds. The mRNA reads it. The tRNA turns it essentially into a protein on the ribosome, and all the rRNA, ribosome RNA does, 
is create a structure for the proteins. At least that's what we've thought for a long time. Mm -hmm. But what these scientists came kind of from a different perspective, especially I think they actually started from a different philosophical perspective, which is, well, since these things are what would drive evolution, this would push evolution forward. What do we know about the ribosome? How can it be acting in this manner? And what's the evolutionary history of what's going on? And when they look at it, they found that this ribosome RNA is actually the ancestor, it appears, of both the mRNA and tRNA. Mm-hmm. So we, they think basically the ribosome at some point evolved the ability to create and push out these things. Correct. And- we do think that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you also think that, it's, that the ribosome is actually three sort of pieces of RNA that form these two subunits, and that it's the simplest of the RNAs, and that that's probably why it's the origin of the other more complicated RNAs? I'm sorry, Mr. Robert Timothy is trying to give lessons. You'd be quiet if you can continue with it. Okay, cheerio, buttfuck. So- <laughs> <laughs> nice laugh catch. So, it does look like the ribosome RNA is the ancestor of those things. It also seems like there's a possibility that it might also be the predecessor of DNA itself, that DNA may have come around as the ribosome's way to essentially store information, like on a hard drive. Mm. So the, that DNA could be the memory stick of RNA as opposed to this driving force behind evolution in terms of the selfish gene that we've thought for at least the last few decades. Wait, what do you think, Dawkins? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot to... <laughs> yes, I, I mean, you have a famous scientist on the show. I, you could plug my book. I wouldn't say famous. I mean, I'm a scientist. But... <laughs> 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 I'm uh, sorry. I, sometimes I burst out with a loud, foolish <laughs> American. Sorry, sorry, Dawkins. I'm going to have to kick you out for a second because I actually separated these questions already. Uh, I want to direct them at Damien first, then Jackie, and then both of them. So, Damien, your first question... As we all learned a few weeks ago, RNA varies from DNA based on the change in one of its four nucleic acids. What is the name of that nucleic acid? All right, I have uh, Dawkins whispering in my ear, so I'm just going to repeat what he says. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is thymine, or as it is called in RNA, TS thymine, or uracil if you're a layman. Transsexual (laughs) thymine. Tranny thymine. Tranny wow. thymine. Okay. I, I was not a, I was. Are you going to argue with Richard Dawkins? I can get him back on the mic here if you prefer. <laughs> you know what? No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's done his time. Good answer. Let's go on to number two. Jackie, if you were building a cell from scratch, could you get away with a stripped down version of just some ribosomes? What would we have to add to that to make it work? I'm trying to think if you imagine. Like, if, if, if the ribosomal RNA is the basis for all the other products in the cell how did that happen can you come to the point where in a abiogenesis scenario all you have to come up with is a ribosome i think it's a simplistic version to say that this is where dna came from and therefore that's where the cells we know today came from as you know all processes in the cell require energy to happen so just to have a ribosome would not be enough. There would have to be some kind of energy. Right. And so mitochondria do that now, right? Right. But and we... mitochondrial DNA is also the basis for genomic DNA. So presumably the ribosomal RNA would have been the brainchild of sure. mitochondrial DNA. So without the mitochondria making, you know, well, and mitochondria obviously, make the most energy, but not all the energy in the cell. But. And obviously, you know, we know that from their different genetic histories that mitochondria, the energy production of the cells, it's actually the result of one organism billions of years ago basically implanting itself into another organism yes. in such a fashion to create one organism that had essentially two separate forms of DNA inside of it. So, Neither of which was genomic DNA as we know it today. Right. So the organism it got into didn't have mitochondria to start with, but it was alive somehow, right? Mm-hmm. So we know that there can be some form of energy functioning without mitochondria. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Like, that's not the only place to get energy. It happens other places of the cell. But you need oh, – it's sort of a chicken and egg situation. You need proteins that – I guess if somebody to have to be able to manufacture that energy in those different parts of the cell, you need a cell, you need a membrane, you need. But that could just be a lipid layer, right? Yeah, right, a lipid bilayer. Yeah, but I think that's one of the things you'd need if we're if we're making a list. I think that if we're making a cell, we got our lipid bilayer. Then we're going to toss some ribosomes in there. What else we going to (laughs) add? We need um, love. Yeah, Mm -hmm. dash dash of love. Sprig of rosemary yeah, a little always bit of, does the trick. A little bit of cinnamon. If you're making a girl, <laughs> sugar, spice, and everything nice. <laughs> yeah. Spice, of course, I'm referring to as a synthetic drug. <laughs> yeah. 
Man, this is such a tough question. I mean, this is the question that we're essentially trying to answer with all yeah, of this, I know. this research, right? I know. But That's why I like just asking you offhandedly <laughs> as, a, as a side to a joke. No, we can bring dogs. Then I'm going to go with the here. rosemary and call it a day. All right, fair enough. <laughs> question number three. If we could control ribosomes, we could essentially eliminate genetic disease as all we'd have to do is tell them to skip over that pesky extra 23rd chromosome or what have you. And even those people who had still technically had a genetic disease would not show the effects of it. Who will benefit most from such technology? Since essentially what you're describing is an army of Down syndrome people, I think Jackie would benefit the most with her Mad Max future. Wait, I thought the, oh, this that's is right. the elimination are... of Down syndrome people, right? I'd have no army. Yeah, there would be no Down syndrome people. Well, for I don't Jackie. like that oh, at all. Well, then if I were some sort of Down syndrome supervillain, then I A Down would... syndrome supervillain? Yes. Does that, oh, does oh. that exist? So wait. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting in the corner this entire time to surprise you with my very non-offensive Down syndrome supervillain voice. <laughs> we did meet you earlier. I, I, we remember because it was almost as if Damien had tried to do a very offensive Down syndrome mm, voice. Yes. Was, it was chastised quite quickly by Jackie and myself. And then all of a sudden we ran into a Down syndrome supervillain who did not have a stereotypical voice that would be offensive to anybody in the Down syndrome community. Right. It's more oh, empowering. Well, well, first off, I think Damien was simply trying to show what not to do. A little bit of Down Richard Dawkins voice. in there, no doubt. <laughs> do not do Richard Dawkins. <laughs> I cannot stress this enough. All right, guys. And that puts us right up to I Call BS. I Call I Call I Call I Call I Call Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, guys. If you've never played before, I call BS is where I give my two co-hosts four science articles that have happened recently, and they tell me whether I'm giving them science or BS, which stands for bad science. I believe I we're think... tied. I'm fighting for my job here. Yeah. 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 Like, you guys I, are tied. There are a lot of people on this episode who might take my job yeah. next week, so I need to win this God one. Goddamn right. Oh, you are getting Rosen, son. <laughs> you know what? Ironically, if you got fired to bring Allison Rosen in, you'd be getting Rosened in two different ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Article number one. A study of dog genetics out of the University of Illinois found that dogs migrated to the New World along with the first humans to occupy the continent fifteen to 20,000 years ago. Article number two. Scientists have determined that being cold can give you a cold. Article number three. Recent studies of archaeological skeletal remains show that thanks to agriculture and proper nutrition, our bones have gotten far more dense over the past 7,000 years. Article number four. The American Cancer Society reports a 22% rise in cancer deaths over the last 20 years and warns of the dangers of the trend continuing. All right, guys. We are all tied up. We'll go ahead and give Damien the first shot. Damien, a study of dog genetics out of the University of Illinois found that dogs migrated to the New World along with the first humans to occupy the continent 15 to 20,000 years ago. Is that science or bad science? That is bad science. Because while they did come over in the New World at that time, the people at that time didn't have peanut butter, so they didn't want to stay. They left. <laughs> they came. They went back. Yeah. They didn't conquer. Yeah, okay. The Russians had peanut butter. <laughs> The Russians. With weird people to have peanut butter, the Russians. <laughs> well, they use borscht. It lasts forever. All right. And Jackie, what do you think? Uh, I also think this is bad science, but slightly different take than Damien. Um, I think that this timeline is off. I think that domestication of dogs isn't in the 20,000 range, or at least what we consider a dog is not quite there. Maybe some other kind of canine but i think it's like a little tricky in there or something all right so jackie says false because the evolution timeline doesn't map out question number two scientists have determined that being cold can give you a cold damien what is your answer i'm gonna say bad science because the only thing that being ice cold can get you is being cooler than being cool <laughs> all right 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 now jackie <laughs> yeah <laughs> We've done this whole joke before. Wow. That bit never gets It never gets old. gets old. All right, Jackie, what about you? Uh, so I think this is science, but I think there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes here. I think that being cold, shivering and, and reacting to, to cold weather sort of shunts all your energy to 
one place and maybe brings down your immune system a little bit. I also think that when people are cold and the times of year that's cold happen to coincide with big holidays, lots of people being around each other, lots of traveling. Um, it also coincides with people staying inside and in small confined spaces for longer periods of time. And so I think all of these things can contribute to the passage of, of a cold. I agree with what she just said because she is very cold to people when she's around them. When <laughs> more people she's around, she just gets colder. <laughs> all right, guys. Article number three, recent st- Studies of archaeological skeletal remains show that thanks to agriculture and proper nutrition, our bones have gotten far more dense over the past 7,000 years. Damien, what do you think? This is bad science, because I've learned everything I know about bones from the show Bones. And I feel like they would have mentioned this. <laughs> okay, I so you... the show was Boners that you watched. Oh, oh yeah. well then, what's Bones? Is yeah. that a show? Yeah. Did I leave off the R? Boners is the show where the guy from Growing Pains just meets his twin double, who's ironically named Boner as well. <laughs> and one of them circumcised the dog. Yeah. Oh, brotherly love. Jackie, what is your response to that? This one was tough for me because when I did breast cancer research, I know that it was um, sort of a new phenomenon that breast tissue was getting denser in people and that it might be predictive in getting cancer. So the idea that tissues are getting denser might lend itself to think that bones are also getting more dense. But the reason why is, is where I'm hung up. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to go with science and, and hope that there's, there's some good reasoning there. Okay. And the last one, the American Cancer Society reports a 22% rise in cancer deaths over the last 20 years and warns of the dangers of the trend continuing. Damien, what do you think? I'm going to say that is science, but they're not referring to cancer to disease. They're referring to people born under the astrological sign, cancer. <laughs> oh, there's, there's an increase in those people. Yes, oh. so that means a lot of people were born in the month of June, which means a lot of people were conceived in September, which means a lot of kids were skipping school and having sex on the or first day of school. Or on the first day of school. Or going to school and having sex with the teacher. Ooh. Good point, Damien. Good point. Yeah. Jackie, gone to you. I'm going to say that this is bad science because I don't think it's that there's more cancer deaths. I think that the deaths attributed to cancer have only gone up due to the increase in diagnosis and early testing. And so it's not that people have 22% more deadly cancers. It's that there's just more people getting diagnosed. And so the numbers have changed, although it's not necessarily so cut and dry. Thanks, Obamacare. <laughs> All right, (laughs) let's go and see how this all turned out and see how you did at home. Article number one, a study of dog genetics out of the University of Illinois found that dogs migrated to the New World along with the first humans to occupy the continent 15 to 20,000 years ago. Damien thinks this is bad science. So does Jackie. This study is bad science. Excelsior. (laughs) Jackie got it almost completely right. The study shows that New World dogs made it here only about 10,000 years ago, likely alongside human migration that came a little bit later, not not necessarily the first one. Now, a couple things about dog domestication. Of course, it happened in China, where Mm -hmm. everything comes from. Right. And... Pugs, first dog. We know that genetically, (laughs) they seem to be like 10 to 15,000 years ago is probably when the dog that we know was, but we have found some skulls of dogs that appear to have a lot of domestic qualities that are like 30,000 years old. Really? So it could be that they were breeding them up until that point, or they had bred them a couple times over or had domesticated something like a dog from a wolf Mm. a few times over. But all the dogs that we know now are all part of the same genetic line that separated around that time. So yes, it's about 10,000 years ago. Good job, both of you. Article number two, scientists have determined that being cold can give you a cold. Damien says bad science. Jackie says science. And this one is... Science. Yes. I'm never trusting Outcast again. (laughs) Oh, don't say, Damien, I don't want that. (laughs) So there's a few things. One is we already knew that the rhinovirus that causes the cold can replicate much better in the cooler temperatures of your nose. So because your nose is cooler than the rest of your core body, it can actually replicate in your nose much, much better than anywhere else, especially when it's cold. But what this new study looks at is actually how your body responds physically when it is cold. And what it showed is those cold parts of the body essentially get little to no immune response. Mm. And so the cold part of the nose not only is cold harboring a good place for that rhinovirus, it's also not putting an immune defense up when you're cold. So if you've been exposed to a lot of germs and stuff and you think, yeah, a sick person. (laughs) It's actually only Andre 3000. I'd like to correct you on that. (laughs) Keep your nose warm. It might keep you from getting sick. Article number three, recent studies of archaeological skeletal remains show that thanks to agriculture and proper nutrition, our bones have gotten far more dense over the past 7,000 years. Damien thinks this is bad science. Jackie thinks this is science. This is 
Bad science. Ah, you just can't finish it. <laughs> They've actually gotten about 20% weaker, a phenomenon that's believed to coincide with a more sedentary lifestyle that can also contribute to bone breaks and osteoporosis. There's your slow metabolism. <laughs> that's right. Thank you, David Boreanaz. <laughs> so the idea isn't that it's genetic, that if you were to take your kid and throw them into a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, they would have these type of bones too. But that just not running around and doing stuff all day long and having that trauma leads to weaker bones. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to see how this pans out because one thing to think about, hunter-gatherers, I mean, yeah, their life was hard. They really only worked about three hours a day and spent the rest of the time kind of Yeah. Uh, They worked about two and a half hours a day longer than Damien. (laughs) That's not to say. They have a job. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's just not being selected for anymore. I'd be interested to see what further studies reveal. But for right now, that does seem to be the case. On to article number four, the last one. You guys have tied up, by the way. Mm -hmm. You guys both got one together, and then you each swap the last two. So let's see how this one goes. For the tiebreaker, the American Cancer Society reports a 22% rise in cancer deaths over the last 20 years and warns of the dangers of the trend continuing. Damien says science. Jackie says bad science. This one is bad science. Yes! I'll have my drawer cleaned out. By the way. I was like <laughs> right. actually holding my breath. <laughs> That's right. So what it is is we actually have a 22% reduction in cancer deaths over that time. Meaning in your that, face, cancer. Yeah, meaning that more than 1.5 million people in America did not die because certain eating and smoking habits have changed while early screening and advances in treatment technology push forward. So basically, we're saving a shit ton of lives. If we had the same technology and health styles that we had in the 90s when Mm. this this first started, we would have lost an extra 1.5 million people, which is kind of a lot of people. That's a crazy amount of change in that time period. It's a crazy amount of change. 20 years or less. Big thing was smoking. A lot of this was male-related cancers from smoking, drinking, that kind of stuff. Health, eating, nutrition, all of that stuff is greatly increased. Boy bands, songs about big butts. These were all cancer-causing things in the 90s. Oh, absolutely. And then think of medical technology. I mean, Uh, back then, there were cancers. If you got the diagnosis, you were just done. You know, There was a lot of things like pancreatic cancer that we have now, where if you get the diagnosis, you're fucked. That was most cancers back then. Now we have a lot of cool shit. Rest in peace, Patrick Swayze. So we finished that one off with Jackie taking the lead by one point. Science prevails in the new year. And as we do, we lead right on over to Finish My Story. Finish My Story where one of us has to complete the other's balls. Okay, for those of you not familiar with Finish My Story, it's where our research scientist Jackie gives us the beginning of a recent scientific article and myself and Damien compete to see who can finish it. Damien, are you ready to play? You know what? I'm going to get my spot back today. Here we go. Let's see it. Let's see it. An informative and surprising recent survey of death certificates by the CDC found an alarming trend among Americans, particularly white men ages 35 to 76. More than that, only 30% of the deaths were considered predictable, and overall, six people are dying every day, resulting in an annual hospital bill for the U.S. that hits about $220 billion. While these fatality numbers seem small when considering the whole U.S. population, an overall death rate of 2,221 people per year on the low end makes what activity one of the leading causes of preventable death in the United States? Tiger punching. Okay. I mean, it is. Okay. First of all, now, unless punching, you, are, you mean punching tigers in the face. Yes. Occasionally in the neck or lower torso. Yeah. Okay. But you're aiming for the face. You're but trying I mean, to get the face. Move. Yeah. Okay. Listen, you only get one shot, really. <laughs> I mean, you you better knock, knock that tiger out. Yeah. You don't get to half ass okay. bitch slap this tiger. I failed to mention that this is in every state. I don't know that there are tigers okay, in every zoo let in me, every state, so that me, might be my yeah, bad. Let me alter that because there's not going to be a lot of tigers in some weird places. All right. Uh, what has killed – and you said it was mostly men? Yeah, men aged 35 to well, 76. White men more specifically. Yeah, white men. Uh, well, then that They would can't to, jump and they're dying. It would have to be sunburns and the inability to dance. Uh, that seems to, sunburn. I can see maybe some melanoma, but yeah, combined the dancing? with the, yeah, it's combined with the inability to dance. It's a lethal combination in most weddings. I mean, you, you are terrible. That's I mean, right. I mean, a wonderful dancer. So I, I don't know. That's where why I wear sun. sunscreen, so that doesn't <laughs> it doesn't add up, you know. And if you just punched a tiger, you can't run in the sun. Yeah. You have to run in the shade if you want to. Oh escape. right, you got to. Uh, Come What could be killing two thousand? I think Damien might have an. Do you want to? Yeah. A bunch of white men are dying every year mm-hmm. due to accidental deaths caused by jumping into giant swimming pools filled with money or gold bars. Wow. That, that is a common... The 1%. 
It's a, com- it's a common pastime, I must admit, that we do do that a lot. So, like, that is the head that wears Scrooge the McDuck. Oh, but here's the thing. You're forgetting the other side of, of the white equation. Oh, You're do, do you tell. The other side of that white teeter-totter. Uh, what else is killing more than 2,000 white men every year in this country? Meth. Okay. Uh, 2,000 white men every year are w- waking up from a coma and dying in the South when they find out who the president is. <laughs> Oh, I am um, two thousand. I I think two thousand is right around the right number to be autoerotic asphyxiation. <laughs> I think that that is almost. I, I'd say two thousand a year, right? You think six a day from strangling that's themselves how, while drinking? That's how Carradine died. David Carradine. Six David Carradines die a day. Well, or well, so I let the authorities to believe. Uh, but I, yeah, okay. <laughs> six white men who pretended to be Asian for a long a lot of time <laughs> die every year. <laughs> There's a white kid with a Dragon Ball Z shirt on who's marked for death. So you're saying it's ninjas. Okay, that's actually, I get that. But thankfully, he he was stopped when his lowered Honda Civic got stuck on a speed bump. (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler indeed. Yeah, well, that might, you know, maybe they just die because they masturbate to so much animated Japanese porn. Mm, Okay. Servings on the dance floor? I thought oh, white men can't. Yeah, they can't. That's why they get served on the dance floor. Oh, they, they get end up dying. served, and, that's yeah. a, and it's a death sentence. A white men will be at a club, and that's just easy pickings. Okay, can we just be honest? Was it tiger punching? It was not. Okay. And you're actually way off, because the answer is raging in Alaska, or more aptly, alcohol poisoning. Oh, so drinking. Yeah. <laughs> just in Alaska. <laughs> I'll get to it. Alcohol poisoning results in the liver cannot process the amount of alcohol consumed in a, quote, binge, and the alcohol is forced back into the bloodstream. When this happens, metabolism is slowed, mm, mm. and the byproducts of that slow metabolism, acetaldehyde, for example, circulate in the bloodstream and disrupt the normal function of lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids pretty much everywhere in the body. This is sort of why you feel really, really shitty when you have a hangover is because your body has basically been functioning abnormally for a couple hours. And you're living in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm getting to Alaska. <laughs> the numbers I discussed were recently released by the CDC in a survey conducted on death certificates ranging from 2010 to 2012 and included death certificate info from everyone in the database above the age of 15. Age-adjusted rates surmise that 8.8 people die per every 1 million of the population each year among persons older than 15. Of that 2,221 people that I mentioned that died due to binge drinking, 75% of them were adult males, white, ages 35 to 64. Most interesting, I think, is Wait that- a second. You're telling me it wasn't a huge Hispanic or black population drinking <laughs> like madmen in Alaska? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> wait, wait. Black and Mexican men flee child custody payments as well. <laughs> Most interesting, I think, is that there was a great range from state to state, and when you adjust the numbers for age, Alaskan Natives slash American Indians had the highest death rate, which worked out to 49.1 people per 1 million population. So the national average is 8.8, and in Alaska, among Alaskan Natives and American Indians, it's 49.1. Sounds about right. (laughs) From state to state, the numbers changed dramatically, from 5.3 deaths per 1 million people in Alabama, which... Good for you, Alabama. I expected a different outcome. That's like thanking MRSA for developing a resistance to antibiotics. Like, (laughs) those people drink nonstop. I'm just saying we don't give them a lot of credit on this show. This one they get. To 46.5 million deaths per 1 million in Alaska. Of the total 2,221 that die, only 30% of all cases are considered alcoholics, meaning that 70% of these deaths could be anything from your 21st birthday to a really boring work party gone wrong. Roughly 38 million people admit to binge drinking within a year, and on average, white males binge drink four times per month, which is pretty damn close because I'm pretty sure all of us binge drink about four (laughs) times every weekend. Well, here's the problem, though, when they're saying only this percentage is alcoholics. That's because in order to get you to be an alcoholic, you have to admit you're an alcoholic, (laughs) and it's really hard to do that intervention once they die. So you got to bring them in and do Weekend at Bernie style. The Jeff Von Dondren from TV show Intervention, he's really good at this. And you got to puppeteer the body and admit that you have an alcohol problem. And then you can record that death as an alcoholic death. Otherwise, it goes completely unrecorded. Plus, a lot of this is cultural as well. You know, they have 23 words for snow, but zero words for alcoholism. That's right. How are you supposed to spread awareness in a community? You're right. You're damn right. So, so the bad news is people are dying. But the great news is Sarah Palin lives in Alaska. It's true. So I think it's a win. Protecting us from Russia. (laughs) And apparently from a bunch of junk white dudes who voted for her. Guys, thanks so much for coming back and joining us for episode 53, our first episode of the new year. We're super excited to bring you a whole new year of science faction, where science meets comedy meets firing Damien. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. 